raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bard who said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and to pull up a chair as we gather together in our very favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub. Autumn is in the air, my friends. And as always, we're happy to be going in pursuit of the mysteries of the ancient past, archaeology, paleontology, good old-fashioned history, and so much more. And, as always, fortunately I'm not sitting here, alone, at the Cross Time Pub all by myself. I'm joined by Jason Pintrail and James Waldo. Waldo, sir, how are you? Sir, I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'll call you sir. I think you've earned that title. You can just call me fella or mister. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Yeah, that one works. Yeah, it's very colloquial. Jason, buddy. Friend. How are you? Um, I am good. Yes, indeed. The leaves are changing colors. Fall is upon us. Uh, we are wrapping up our soccer season tonight for the little ones. I'm the coach, so we're bringing that to an end tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to the fall. You guys all know it. We say it all the time. Fall is my favorite time of the year. But uh, I think it might be a little cooler up there around the old Appalachian Mountains. Uh, probably out your way, too, there, James. But uh, great weather here in sunny uh, South Carolina here on the coast in Charleston, and I'm very much looking forward to the cool weather. Yeah, me too. I'm already enjoying it, in fact, although it was quite chilly last night as my brother Caleb and I and the lovely lady Charlotte, his wife, the three of us, we headed out to Waynesville to see our good friend Justin Biltonen, who is the bassist with a national touring band known as Three Doors Down, but he also is a singer-songwriter, and he performs uh, solo shows by himself and he was joined by a special guest my brother got a mandolin out and got up there and joined him for a few songs yesterday and then we ended up in the parking lot afterwards enjoying a cold brew because the venue closed shortly thereafter and as we stood there it really began to set in for me just how close to the end of the year we are now getting as we make our way more than halfway through october yes the chilly mountain air was quite nippy indeed and uh, Caleb's wife decided to sit in the car and try and warm up for a little while. Now, fortunately, Caleb and I, we had our liquid refreshments that helped keep us warm and certainly brought some cheer to the conversation. But it was great to see all the guys. And I got to tell you something, too, about Three Doors Down. Uh, you probably remember them, you know, back when I was in high school. They had their big hit Superman and everything. Justin joined the band many years later. And I knew him previously from various bands that we all played in and out of together in the Asheville area. But then he joined as their bass player. And the thing about Justin is that when you meet him in real life, I mean, he's like a whole head taller than me. I put a picture on my Instagram, in fact, and plus with this cowboy hat he's wearing, it makes him look even taller. But he's down there on stage with the guys at Three Doors Down, and on that stage with all the lighting and that really cool Thunderbird bass that he plays, I mean, he looks like he's 10 feet tall, right? So we had a really good time at the show, but then afterward, Justin said, I want to introduce you to some of my friends. They're all into history. They're all into archaeology. They're all into geology. They're all into paleontology. Uh, and one of the fellows that they introduced me to, Matt, who's from over in Arkansas, his favorite thing is walking the creeks, looking for fossils. He was showing me stones and things that he had found. And I said, boy, have I got some people you guys need to meet. So that's what we were into over the weekend. And I'm sure we'll be hearing some more from them. But I hope in the near future we'll maybe have an opportunity to do some rock hounding and some fossil hunting together. Maybe as the warmer weather approaches, since we're heading into the cooler season right now. Now, it's not going to get cool too soon down there where you are, Jason. So I may have to uh, relinquish my fossil hunting to the South Carolina area where it's going to be pretty warm, I'd say, for the next few months, regardless of what time of the year it is. That's right. We don't really have much of a winter here. And, you know, I do have to say I saw the pictures that you posted. Justin is indeed a large fellow. That's the first thing I noticed. I'm like, wow, I'm six foot two. And this guy looks like he's a head bigger than I am. He is. <laughs> so yeah, uh, quite, quite striking. Oh yeah. yeah. He's a tall guy, but you know, we were talking about all the stuff and some of the things that have been happening. Some of the incredible changes that are occurring uh, right now in the sciences. I mean, just a couple. In fact, I'll go ahead and kind of get into one of these here in the interest of time, because we've got a great conversation we're going to be getting into here just in a bit with Kevin Nolan, Tim McCoy, Laura Murphy, and also Tony Cruz, 
Before we get to that, Jason's going to tell you all about what these fine folks have to bring to the table. Quite a lot happening in the world of archaeology. But here's a story I wanted to share just to kind of underscore that. You guys may have seen that recently there was a Paleolithic art site. It was discovered in a region of Spain where these kinds of discoveries generally have not been made in the past. I find this really fascinating because most Paleolithic cave art is found in caves in the northern part of Spain or in southern France. Usually you don't find anything this far south on Europe's eastern Iberian coast, but recently at what's known as Cova Duns, which is near Milares, and that's a short distance away from Valencia, Spain, they found what they are now hailing as arguably the most important cave art discovery in that region, because in a 500 meter long cave, 24,000 year old cave art depicting obviously extinct megafauna and other species has been detected. And so this is really remarkable stuff. In fact, I've got a link there in the show notes at my very own website over there, thedebrief.org. We do cover archaeology there too from time to time. But you can see some of the imagery, and I'm looking at it right now. One of the first things they found was an auroch. Now, I don't know if everybody out there knows this. Those species existed back during the Pleistocene, but they were actually remnant populations until as recently as around the 1600s, the middle 1600s, I believe. The last ones, I think, died out in Poland. But naturally, when you go into a cave and you see depictions of these and other species that died up much earlier, that's the kind of thing that really gets archaeologists extremely excited. And that's what Aitor Ruiz Redondo, who's a senior lecturer of prehistory at the University of Zaragoza, had to say. He led a lot of the research effort in these caves and was absolutely spellbound by what he found. But again, in a region where you don't expect to find these kind of things... And this excites me because there are so many discoveries like these recently that have been reshaping our perspectives on the past. Jason, I know you've got another one here that you want to bring to the table, and it's one, in fact, that we've talked about in the past. We have spoken with some of the people who have actually worked on this. It had remained very controversial, but there has been something of a resolution, as I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, you know, last year, this was a big story. We talked about it. Uh, all the ins and outs and intricacies of uh, all the things that could go wrong with the famous footprints that were found in New Mexico. So uh, we got an update on that. There's some really interesting news. And uh, again, if you're not familiar with this, this was a dry lake bed where these uh, supposedly very ancient footprints were found. And I remember we discussed about, you know, what are the chances of these things being impressed into that material and, and, and lasting this long? And of course, it was still very controversial at the time. But Quoting here from the USGS, who wrote this latest article, it says, Study confirms age of oldest fossil human footprints in North America. Two new lines of evidence support the 21,000 to 23,000 year old estimate of the footprints first described and dated back in 2021. So looking at some of the details, it says, uh, in September 2021, the U.S. Geological Survey researchers and an international team of scientists announced that human footprints discovered at the White Sands National Park were between 21,000 and 23,000 years old. This discovery pushed the known date of human presence in North America back thousands of years and implied that early inhabitants and megafauna coexisted for several millennia before the terminal Pleistocene extinction event. In a follow-up study published today in Science, researchers used two new independent approaches to date the footprints, both of which resulted in the same age range as the original estimate. So again, we're seeing here, uh, I really appreciate the fact that they're going back and revisiting it rather than just saying, you know, here's the evidence, take it for what it is, take it or leave it. Uh, there's follow-up research here, and I find that to be really interesting. Returning to the article here, it says the 2021 results began a global conversation that sparked public imagination and incited dissenting commentary throughout the scientific community as to the accuracy of the ages. Quote, the immediate reaction in some circles of the archaeological community was that the accuracy of our dating was insufficient to make the extraordinary claim that humans were present in North America during the last glacial maximum. But our targeted methodology and this current research really paid off, said Jeff Pagatti, USGS research geologist and co-lead author of the newly published study that confirms the age of the White Sands footprints. And of course, there's much more in the article here. They really break down some of the details about what you would find at a site like this. But, you know, again, it's something that really captures the imagination. Uh, again, I appreciate the fact that follow-up research is being done and to have not only one, but two outside sources 
uh, redate it to to the match what the original estimate was to me uh, is very, very interesting. And so, uh, James, I know that you had a lot to say about this in our first conversation, so I'll throw it back to you for your comments. Yeah, certainly. And I appreciate it, Jason. You know, there's there's a couple, three things here I want to talk about. And one, obviously, is it pushes back human occupation, known human occupation in North America by, you know, at least 10,000 years or, or up to 10,000 years. Um, and the, but the, the second thing is the improbability of these footprints being preserved and then being found later on and having the, the right components in the footprint itself that could be tested, right? That's pretty amazing. But when we first talked about this, we talked about the low hanging fruit which is uh, the possibility for error in the dating, right? So one of the important things that, that for field science is when you do sample collection or you do data collection of any kind in the field is your methodology, because that's always going to be the low-hanging fruit to critics, you know, and that's the, that's the one place where you could possibly make a mistake and then have a, you know, completely misinterpreted site. So... Uh, and I think that the people that do field science out there and obviously archaeologists and uh, people who collect samples uh, for analysis later would, would, you know, certainly would feel the pain there on that because that's the one thing that got that got attacked. And, and uh, even in, you know, in commercial industry and in, in environmental science, when you collect samples for uh, any kind of site, uh, if it ever goes to litigation, that's the one thing that they're gonna they're gonna focus on is how the samples co- were collected, how the data was preserved, how the samples per- were preserved, and what the analytical process is. So they're gonna look at your field methods. They're gonna look at what you did in the field, how you recorded the data, and then they're gonna look at the lab and look at how the lab analyzed the data, what the reporting was, uh, you know, what their margins of error were, and and all that kind of thing. So it's a it's a you know it's a complicated thing, but you really want to make sure that your case can be as airtight as possible uh, so that your, you know, so that your results are accurate. And that's exactly what we see here. The the researchers that collected the data in the field were uh, uh, eventually proven to be right. Yeah, which in itself, of course, is both very educational, uh, but it's yet again showing us the ways that we are able to collect a whole lot more data and we're able to perform, I think, much more rigorous analyses uh, with the Uh, calibration and the dating methods and the various different kinds of studies that can be implemented. Because again, in this one, the initial studies, the question had to do with these uh, aqueous plants and their tendency to pull up carbon, which may not have been an accurate representation of the date in question, but then independent analysis of different kinds of pollen, for instance, from conifers. Uh, You add to that, of course, the OSL dating that was applicable. I mean, again, a few decades ago, all we had to rely on was radiocarbon dating, but it has distinctive limitations. And then before that, it was stratigraphy. So now we have all these different, and and again, so much more than what I'm just covering right now, but with all these different methods of dating and analysis, and also the way that we manage the data that we collect, we're really starting to broaden the bigger picture, push back the timescales on human migrations into North America, and also take on a much better understanding of the kinds of things that people were doing uh, however early they were here. And the same applies to ancient people all around the world, as in the case with the European cave art. We are learning incredible things about the ancient past. And I think that really our understanding of the life ways and the practices of people who lived thousands, tens of thousands of years ago is becoming a much clearer picture than it once was for us. I'll tell you, one thing that's also clear is that there's a lot happening over on the Patreon page right now for Seven Ages. Jason, you want to give us an update on that? Absolutely. Well, Patreon, uh, you know, we continue to work with it. We're uh, trying out some new things. There's been a lot of updates to Patreon themselves. They're actually adding some new features to the website. So we're going to be looking to implement some of those after the first of the year. That way we can interact even more with our audience. But yeah, we've still got all of our standard podcasts, the Cross Time Pub, Digging Deeper, and of course the Green Dragon Book Club. And uh, some roundtable discussions, hopefully, that we'll have coming up here soon. But we continue to grow it and adding more material to it all the time. So we certainly encourage you to go over there to Patreon. Just type in Seven Ages Audio Journal. It'll pop right up. And you can check out all the tiers and things that we offer on our Patreon. And we're always looking forward to meeting new folks there on that particular channel. Absolutely. I already mentioned also the conversation we're about to be getting into and who our guests are. But Jason, maybe before we dive into that, you can tell us a little bit about this one. 
this a conversation that you were able to have. I was unfortunately absent. I had to tend to other matters during my travels and other otherwise crazy schedule. But yes, we have a great conversation coming up here. Can you give us an idea of what we are about to hear? So this is a little bit out of the realm of what we normally do here on the show. Um, however, it was something that you don't see that often uh, with the fact that a particular scientific paper known as the Hopewell Airburst event 1699 to 1567 years ago, 252 to 383 CE, uh, was published uh, in a well-known journal and then the journal Nature and actually uh, at this point has been retracted uh, based off of uh, some other evidence that has been put forth by the team that we spoke to tonight, who consisted of doctors uh, Kevin Nolan, Tony Cruz, Laura Murphy, and Tim McCoy of the Smithsonian Institution. And together, uh, they assembled some evidence to refute what was published here in this paper. And uh, again, I wanted to take the opportunity to see where their thoughts were at, uh, see how they came to these conclusions, and of course, all of uh, these uh, scientists work in and around the Hopewell area and certainly have a connection to that culture. And so with all all the things that are going on in Ohio with UNESCO and, and everything, it's getting a lot of attention right now. So I wanted to uh, put a spotlight on this particular paper and just kind of see how this whole process works. And that's what we discuss tonight. Yeah, I'm eager to get into this, of course, with my own personal interest in Hopewell science and our visits there in the past. Hope to get back up there in the future. But yeah, let's dive right into this because it is, like you said, very rare to see these kind of circumstances unfolding, and yet this is an integral part of the scientific process. Having a better understanding of the data and being willing to say, hey, you know, there was one thing that we presumed initially, but that's what the data pointed to. Now the data points in a different direction. Here are our latest findings. So Kevin Nolan, Tim McCoy, Laura Murphy, and Tony Cruz join us here in a moment when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Seven Ages Audio Journal, we have a roundtable discussion of great importance. We are certainly happy to have this great panel here joining us on the show tonight. I want to introduce our guest first. Uh, Dr. Kevin Nolan is Director and Senior Archaeologist in the Applied Anthropology Laboratories, an institute within the College of Sciences and Humanities at Ball State University. His research specializes in prehistoric archaeology, CRM, GIS, Ohio River Valley, paleo environments, soil geochemistry, and geophysics. Next, we have Dr. Tony Cruz is an assistant professor at the University of South Dakota in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. His current research focuses on chronological modeling, human environmental relationships, and archaeological fieldwork of late Holocene communities, primarily in the eastern woodlands and the plains. Next, we have Tim McCoy, who is a curator of meteorites at the Smithsonian Institution. His work primarily focuses on using meteorites to understand the differentiation of asteroids in the early solar system, and he has worked on six robotic spacecraft missions. Relative to this project, he has studied artifacts made from iron meteorites, including Hopewell beads from Havana, Illinois. Rounding on our panel tonight, we have Dr. Laura Murphy, an associate professor of anthropology at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, where she teaches many archaeology courses, including the popular Archaeological Myths, Frauds, and Controversies course. She is a geoarchaeologist specializing in paleoenvironmental reconstruction using soils. Dr. Murphy holds her bachelor's degree from The Ohio State University and her MA and PhD from the University of Kansas. She is also a former National Park Ranger who worked at Hopewell Cultural National Historical Park in Chillicothe, Ohio. I am also joined by my co-host James Waldo and we are looking forward to this. So tonight what we're going to be talking about is a paper that was published by Dr. Kenneth uh, Tankersley, or was written rather, he was the primary author along with his team, called the Hopewell Airburst Event 1699 to 
1567 years ago. Now, you may remember uh, when this paper first came out, we did mention it in our news section on that month's episode. There was a lot of controversy around it when it first came out, but looking ahead here several months, uh, we see that not only has the controversy continued to bloom, but even to the point that this paper has been uh, refuted. And actually, uh, if you go look at the paper now, it will have a attachment to it telling you the details of why this paper has essentially been retracted. So our guests tonight are going to break it down. They have written a refutal to this, and they are basically showing their information of what is wrong with the paper and why it's important to uh, focus on these type of things in the world of archaeology because We need to get the data straight, and especially when it's concerning something as prominent and large as the Hope Well, which is a very prominent techno complex, uh, well-known culture, and we need to make sure that we're getting all of this information right. So their paper, published in Nature.com, is refuting the sensational claim of a Hope Well ending cosmic airburst. And so we have four of those team members here tonight, and we're looking forward to getting into it. So welcome all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So referring back to the Tankersley paper, the Hopewell Airburst event of 1699 to 1567, I'm going to begin with the abstract, and then we're going to get into a little bit more about the Hopewell themselves, but so that you can all be on the same page about what this paper is, and we're going to include this in the show notes. So I would encourage everybody, as we're going through this conversation, feel free to go to the show notes, pull up this paper, along with the paper that was refuting the information in here. Follow along. There's a lot of great information there, and that way you can see it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. But the abstract from that paper uh, is as followed, and this was uh, published in Scientific Reports, number 12, article number 1706, back in 2022, and it was retracted the 30th of August, 2023. So the abstract is as follows. Meteorites, iron and silicone rich microspherals, positive iridium and platinum anomalies, and burned charcoal rich Hopewell habitation services demonstrate that a cosmic airburst event occurred over the Ohio River Valley during the late Holocene. A comet-shaped earthwork was constructed near the airburst epicenter. 29 radiocarbon ages establish that the event occurred between 252 and 383 CE, a time when 69 near-Earth comets were documented. While Hopewell survived the catastrophic event, it likely contributed to their cultural decline. The Hopewell airburst event expands our understanding of the frequency and impact of cataclysmic cosmic events on complex human societies. Okay, now there's a lot of information there. So before we get into the hope, well, first, I, I want to go around the panel here, uh, give everyone a chance to introduce themselves a little bit more and what their role was here in this paper. And we're going to talk first about what your initial impressions were when you saw this paper come out and you had a chance uh, to move through it and look at all of the information. We're going to start with Dr. Kevin Nolan. So Dr. Nolan, I know you're very passionate about this. So tell us when you first saw this publication, uh, what first ran through your mind? Well, the first thing I thought was, is this actually true or is it just some speculation that that Tankersley is putting out? Um, And so I started reading it after I saw several uh, news coverages of it and started to immediately find issues with it and started sharing my reactions online through Facebook and started getting a bunch of other colleagues that were agreeing. And that's actually kind of how this group started to come together for this, this effort to refute it and try to get it retracted. Okay. Very good. Yes. I do remember when this came out, it was a hot topic and it was bouncing all over social media and people were sending it to me and asking for comments and so on and so forth. Let's go to Dr. Murphy. Dr. Murphy, what were your impressions? Uh, Again, this uh, is probably really close to how you feel about this because you worked in this area. So I know the Hopewell has a very special connection with you. What did you think about this? Well, I I first couldn't really believe that the um, Hopewell would be the next victims of a cosmic catastrophe. Um, We've been seeing this quite a bit in other parts of the world and other time periods as comets, you know, speculation to destroy cultures. And so I was actually quite surprised to see that the Hopewell were, were victims of that. And I thought, really, oh boy, here we go again. And, you know, taking a look at some of the arguments um, it was immediately clear that it wasn't going to hold up. And, um, 
you know, many of my uh, students know that uh, I'm pretty passionate about this this topic and getting a lot of messages and uh, from them. And I took a, a deeper look into it and uh, knew I had to team up with some people to actually um, do something about this. Very well. And again, you know, this is something that's one of those topics that, you know, strike people at the core because there's so much part of so much uh, of someone's life and their research. And so when these things kind of come out of left field, it can often be kind of jarring. Let's go over to Dr. Cruz. Uh, how did you get involved with this research and, and what did it mean to you when you saw this paper? Well, when I first saw this paper, I just thought, well, this looks like a, another example of a overly sensationalized, but probably not very well vetted publication. But it wasn't until Dr. Nolan asked me to join the team and I started really diving deep into the chronology aspect of the analysis in particular that I became apparent just how poorly conceived the entire study by Tankersley et al. was. So yeah, and just just to be clear, my my role in this project deals with the chronology side of Tankersley et al.'s paper, which is my one of my main areas of expertise. Absolutely. And so bringing the conversation to Tim McCoy, again, he is the curator of media rights at the Smithsonian Institution. Now, Tim, as someone who lives in this world, I am very interested to see what your impressions were. Yeah, so um, I am not an archaeologist or an anthropologist. I am a planetary scientist. And so I didn't see this article when it first came out. A colleague sent it to me. And of course, as you said, the first word of the abstract is meteorites. And they said, what's your reaction? And I, I just read it. At first, I'm like, palisites and comets, well, that makes no sense at all. But I didn't dig into it much past that. And a couple of days later, this group of archaeologists led by Dr. Nolan sends me this email saying, hey, would you take a closer look at this? And so I sit down and actually read the paper in some detail. And the more I read, the less sense it made and the less there was actually the evidence they claimed was there. I mean, the data they presented didn't make sense. We'll have a chance to talk about that. But yeah, I was pretty incredulous from the first side. I, I have worked on Hopewell artifacts. Uh, I'm from a, dis, uh, a community uh, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, whose homelands are from there. And so I'm sort of personally invested in what we think about this region. But um, yeah, I came into it very casually and got very deeply involved. I'm really I'm grateful for the chance to join a group of esteemed archaeologists to actually work on this as someone who's a complete outsider to archaeology. Well, I think it's great. You know, every year we're seeing more and more scientific disciplines coming together for these type of things, learning from each other, including, you know, geological surveys, including uh, LIDAR and GIS and archaeology and, you know, even folklore and things. It's, it's wonderful to see all of these people coming together. One more thing I want to address from the archaeological side before we get into letting everyone know about the Hopewell themselves, because we certainly don't want to overlook the significance of this very important Ohio River Valley culture. But they mention here in the abstract, a comet-shaped earthwork was constructed near the airburst epicenter. Dr. Nolan, I want to come over to you first. Honestly, this was the first time I had heard about this, and uh I really don't know any background on it. Is this at all accurate or what are your thoughts? I mean, the the map that he shows in the article is a, as accurate as a 19th century map of earthworks is. Um, so it looks the way it, it looks in that figure. But saying that it's a comet would, is a bit far-fetched to me. And also, I don't know a whole lot about this. I haven't done any research specifically on that site, but I think it was Brad... Lepper pointed out that when you actually look at the whole site, that does the shape of that one doesn't really stand out, and it's not an isolated thing. It's part of a larger ceremonial landscape, and you know it's also kind of interesting because the comet was supposed to have ended earthwork building, and yet most of the evidence they claimed to have found was in earthworks and mounds, and it also inspired earthwork building. So it was the alpha and the omega of earthwork building, and that doesn't make any sense. That is a very good point. 
And so, again, uh, you mentioned Dr. Bradley Lepper. He is a good friend of the show. Uh, he has appeared on the show in the past as well and does great work there in the area. So we're looking forward to, uh, to maybe talking with him a little bit about this in the future as well. I want to now get into a conversation for our listeners about the Hope Well. So, again, if you're not familiar with this particular culture, Techno Complex, uh, they are fascinating, and they did wonderful things there in the Ohio River Valley. So, Dr. Nolan, again, if you want to head off this discussion, let's learn a little bit more about what made the Hope Well so interesting to study and what was their influence in this area. Well, it's probably if anybody knows any archaeological site in the Ohio Valley, it's probably one of the, the Hope Well sites. Um, they've got hundreds of earthwork complexes ranging from a single uh, square or circular enclosure to hundreds of acres dozens of square miles of uh, of a ceremonial landscape and so there are these massive architectural complexes made out of earth and stone uh, that they performed a lot of rituals and ceremonies and community gatherings in um, but they're also inscribing on the ground their understanding of the relationships in nature and so you know one of the Examples that gets talked about a lot is the Newark earthworks and the the lunar cycles. Um, you know, there's an 18.6 year cycle there. The the moon rise goes from its southern extreme to its northern extreme, and so that's something you only see about once in a generation. And the main axis of the Newark earthworks is oriented to that. And, and so, you know, when uh, a, a, these uh, relationships to the sky were very important to them. And most of the stuff that we know comes from the earthworks because they got a lot of attention from the early antiquarians and looters that came into uh, the Ohio Valley. And so they, that got attention first. And it's only been in the last 20 or so years that we've actually had excavations of their, their habitation sites, their homes. And they didn't live in the earthworks. They lived in small extended family communities usually scattered around the earthworks and then those scattered communities would come together at the earthworks to to create recreate reinforce their community identities uh, and, and celebrate together and so they were independent farmers no real hierarchical uh, structure to their society has been encountered contrary to what was initially thought with the massive uh, architecture, a lot of early scholars expected them to have kings or chiefs or whatever, some kind of authority leadership. And it's, it's much, much less hierarchical than that based on all the evidence that we have now. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we've had this discussion here recently, actually, about the Hope Well. And again, I encourage everyone to go look up these sites, learn more about the Hope Well. They are certainly a fascinating time period. I want to bring the conversation over to Dr. Murphy because not only are you looking at this from the archaeological standpoint, but you have actually worked at a Hopewell site as a park ranger. And so I think you may have some insight uh, from a little bit different view. And what I would be interested in is, A, your take on the Hopewell uh, in general. What what are the highlights for you about this particular techno complex and culture? But I also want your thoughts on being a park ranger, because I know with that interaction with the public that you have had to have some gems of a question or two come across your desk. And I would like to see how... The general public that are coming to these sites, uh, what's in their mind when they get there? Well, the first thing I would say that strikes me the most is just how innovative um, this collective group of people were throughout the middle Ohio River Valley. Folks coming together uh, to be extremely innovative in their use of soil in particular and how they um, had a knowledge and understanding of the landscape that still sort of eludes us white settler archaeologists today. We work really hard to uh, look at their different soil strategies that they use to collect different soils to build the mounds and the earthworks. And it was with incredible innovation and with great care that they would then bury their deceased in these brilliant burial mounds and, you know, protect them to where many of them are still standing today that haven't been looted or plowed over and things by um, westward expansion. So really just the the innovation and that trade network of uh, materials from all over the um, 
Western Hemisphere, really, and just having those connections. I had a chance to uh, recently visit the Obsidian Cliffs in Wyoming and just how powerful that landscape was where they were collecting and trading for the obsidian out there to make it all the way back to the middle, middle Ohio R- River Valley is quite remarkable. And so, yes, um, being a park ranger was a very interesting experience with folks from all over the world coming to visit. It kind of points to how uh, unique and special these places are. And also got a lot of folks on the kind of the pseudo or what we call fringe side who would come and want to know about, oh, did did aliens land here? Um, you know, all sorts of different things like that. People who would who'd come in with um, their research ideas that the earthworks were particle accelerators and things like that. So uh, I got the whole range of, of folks, but it was very fulfilling just being able to teach young kids that would come in every day um, to visit these sacred sites. And so I never took that piece for granted. Yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you're here and you have both of those perspectives. I think that's really important for the conversation. Dr. Cruz, uh, when we're talking about the Hope Well, what is most, uh, we've kind of covered some of this, but what sticks out to you the most? What is most striking about the Hope Well to you? Well, I think it's the Hope Wellian trade networks. And I've been fortunate enough to have Dr. Nolan guest lecture in one of my classes in the past about that topic. And I know when Dr. Nolan stopped by my class for that guest lecture, the my students were just um, just so impressed by the geographic breadth of the Hopewellian trade networks. And that led to a really cool kind of group conversation about what, what was driving all of that. So um, I, while I'm myself not an expert in Hopewellian archaeology, I just have a, a great appreciation for that, what's going on with those networks and, and also just with the range of um, incredible like earthworks that they were creating as well. Again, being at these sites myself, I've had the opportunity to go up there and, and visit many of these sites along with uh, the Adena sites, which I also have a great appreciation for. That whole entire area is just a, uh, a wonderland of archaeology for anyone interested in these things. So we certainly encourage everyone to make their way up there and uh, see these things for yourself. It is certainly worth the trip. Now, getting back to the main crux of the conversation here, we started tonight with the abstract from the Tankersley paper. So we all have an idea of what's being presented there. Now, refuting the sensational claim of a Hopewell ending cosmic airburst is addressing this directly. And so let's begin here. I'm going to read this brief portion from the intro of that paper so that you can see as the listener how uh, these two papers are communicating with each other. So, quote, Tankersley et al. claim a cosmic airburst over modern-day Cincinnati, Ohio in the 3rd or 4th century CE catalyzed the decline of Hopewell culture. This claim is extraordinary in the face of hundreds of archaeological investigations in the middle Ohio River Valley that have heretofore provided no evidence of a widespread cataclysm or social decline in need of explanation. Tankersley et al. misrepresent primary sources, conflate discrete archaeological context, improperly use chronological analysis, insufficiently describe methods, and inaccurately characterize the source of supposed extraterrestrial materials to support an incorrect conclusion. Okay, so that is a very powerful statement and That's going to lead me to the retraction. Again, I want to read this for the listeners. On the 30th of August, 2023, the retraction occurred. Quote, if you go there to this this article, you will see the following. Quote, following publication of this article, concerns have been raised by Nolan et al. about errors in methodology, analysis, interpretation of the data in the article, indicating that the study does not provide data to support the claims of an airburst event or such an event led to the decline of Hopewell culture. Given these concerns, the editors no longer have confidence that the conclusions presented are adequately supported. Okay, Dr. Nolan, we're going to bring it to you. Tell me about the building of the paper. Uh, You've already mentioned how you got the team together, but let's begin with... You've read the paper. Everyone's had their reaction. You feel the personal need to set the record straight. Where do you begin from there? 
Uh, well, so once we got everybody together uh, off of my original ranting that I was doing on Facebook, we identified three main areas uh, that we wanted to focus on, which is the, the Hopewell archaeological record in, in general, but specifically the, the new results reported by Tankersley, and then the chronological modeling, and then the, the geochemistry. And so then we, I, we identified uh, people uh, that we knew of that had expertise in each of those areas and reached out to them and that's how we we ended up with well actually i guess brad did the reach out to to dr murphy but they uh that's how we ended up getting and uh, tony and uh tim on board to and to do this because well i i don't do meteorites or cosmic geochemistry so <laughs> I, I needed someone to be able to uh to to address that and there's nobody that I know of, especially in, in North American archaeology, that knows more about and is better with chronological modeling and calibration of radiocarbon dates than, than Tony. So we reached out to, to him and asked him to come on. And then once we had all 12 people talking, then we just started throwing out ideas of how to, what uh, what to focus around and, and collaboratively develop an outline. And then Everybody signed up for different parts of it to do to do some digging on and writing on, and then just kept emailing updates back and forth, and then stitched it together and tried to send it into <laughs> to the editor, which was a, a process in and of itself. Yes, absolutely. Well, if you're following along with us again, look at those show notes. Pull up this paper for yourself. The way that it's laid out, you have your introduction, your archaeological context, chronological modeling, cosmic geochemistry, and then data availability followed by references and acknowledgements. So a lot of individual topics are covered in great detail. The first one being archaeological context. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about what's highlighted there. But before we do that, uh, Dr. Murphy, I want to come back to you for a moment because uh, I think it's important to understand how everyone's uh, participation played into this paper. So when you were contacted about the potential of this paper being written, uh, what was your primary function and job for this paper? Well, in having side conversations with uh, Brad Lepper, we were really just starting to talk about um, how we've seen this kind of repeatedly now with misconceptions of how any kind of extraterrestrial fallout and things like that occur in soils. And so it kind of brought me on to give another geoarchaeological look at the paper and to sort of look at some of the arguments to see if it passed the make, make sense test for how some of these extraterrestrial items were ending up in the archaeological record or what they were reporting. And so, like I said, I've, you know, I've looked at, at uh, other papers and soils here in, in the Great Plains as well that give us this background of kind of knowing how there's all sorts of carbon spherules, microspherules, all these things from extraterrestrial rain out and fallout that naturally develop in soils. And so being able to kind of come at, come at the, this with that perspective, again, gave kind of a new new perspective there. So having that background, having knowing, knowing how some of these other comet catastrophe claims have been put out in the literature and how those have been criticized as well um, was one of my starting points. Okay, very good. And I'm going to bring the conversation over to Dr. Cruz here. But again, as we're looking at the team, looking at the paper, uh, I just want to make sure that everyone has a clear understanding of each person's role. And of course, there's other people involved with this paper as well. Uh, We're just fortunate to have this group here tonight. But again, uh, look into it and and make sure you look at all of the references and the data. So Dr. Cruz, uh, what was your role in this paper? Well, ideas about chronology are really central to the Tankersley et al. paper. For example, their calculation for when the airburst occurred is a part of the title of the paper. So my role in the team was to kind of critique and figure out what exactly they did for their chronological analysis and assess to see if that makes sense. Okay, so again, we're, we're assembling the team. And then Tim McCoy, being outside of the world of archaeology, I think it's pretty obvious why you were brought in. But tell us about your experience with the paper and, and what were you focusing on particularly? I was really looking at the evidence that there was meteoritic material 
and whether that meteoritic me, meteoritic material was consistent with a cometary origin, and uh, using a variety of uh, isotopic and geochemical techniques, I was able to send a response fairly quickly um, that I'm not sure my co-authors completely understood, but they appreciated. And so we were able to work through that over the next uh, several months and actually put that in some language. They were very helpful in doing that. And I would just add that one of my interests in doing this is that I, I think the archaeological community has really been talking about pseudo-archaeology. They do a really good job talking about pseudo-archaeology. There was a whole session on it at the Society for American Archaeology meeting I went to in Portland. But it's really pseudoscience. I mean, when you start bringing in extraterrestrial materials, when you start bringing in planetary science, you know, you're not just in the realm of archaeology. And I think we have to combat this collectively and cohesively, not just from archaeolo- from the archaeological perspective. We're seeing more and more of this in archaeology and the sciences in general as we move forward. It's, it's that cooperation between various sciences, and I think it's a wonderful thing. Getting back to the archaeological context, however, there's a lot of data presented here, so I'll allow the listener to follow along with that, and, and they can read a lot of that uh, specific data for themselves. But Dr. Nolan, you had a lot of issues with the archaeological context of this paper. So give us an overview of that context. What were you seeing that was in question? In archaeology, we have to really carefully track where things are coming from, how deep in the ground they are, what they're associated with. Uh, Is it in part of the natural soil column? Is it in something that was built up by humans or a hole that was excavated and filled in by humans, um, all of those things matter. And so you can have two of these deposits, human-made deposits, that are right next to each other, but they're not necessarily related to each other uh, in time or culturally. And so it can be different groups of people coming uh, later in in that same general time period, or it can be thousands of years later. Um, And so you have to, if you have a a date, you have to establish the connections between what you're dating and the rest of the material that you want to explain. And so that's, uh, in terms of matching the context, that's one of the really big things that the Tankersley et al. team didn't actually follow through with standard, standard methodology. There's a lot more wrong with uh, with their analysis and their presentation than what we could fit into what was supposed to be 1,200 words for our reply to their uh, to their paper. But one of the biggest ones was that they're claiming that they found a burned heavily burned Hopewell habitation surface at uh, the Marietta earthworks, and that there are dates for that. And then they did their own uh, trenching and testing uh, at that same site. And they found supposedly elevated uh, platinum and iridium levels there. And they're like, oh, okay, so these dates from this burned floor and our results showing this this spike. Well, see, we have something that happened during the Middle Woodland and we have this extraterrestrial material. And neither of those things are true um, because those dates came from a kilometer away. It's over two thirds of a mile away from where they did their own sampling, and it's a meter deep in the ground. And it's not a house floor or a village surface that was burnt, it's a constructed ceremonial fire basin. So, they just like they did with all the earthworks, they went and they gathered very specific sediments, they sorted it by size to get really nice clays out of there, and then they built up this clay basin, and then they had fire after fire after fire on it for their community gatherings and celebrations. And sometimes that's, they were destroying, uh, sacrificing tons and tons of artifacts, and and sometimes they were cremating uh, humans and and people from members of the community to to send them on, on their next journey. Um, And and so these are well-known things that that occur in the Hopewell archaeological record at many of these ceremonial sites, and none of them are domestic in in nature. They're all ceremonial. They're very special community structures, and it's a result of dozens, if not hundreds, of fires intentionally set in the same place. And so those dates date that were uh, co- for uh, material collected by uh, Nomi Grieber and Bill Pickard, yeah, that dates the time period for that surface, but it doesn't have any relationship to the un 
And we still don't know exactly where it came from, but the, the unrelated earthwork or non-earthwork space where they took their samples from. Uh, there's no relationship, and that happens in every single one. There's one that's even the one that uh, we didn't cover it in our paper, um, but we do talk about it when we gave a presentation at the OAC, uh, Ohio Archaeological Council meeting in spring of 2022, the Indian Fort Mountain, some of the artifacts that they try to copy in to match their samples from the earthworks are almost two miles away. And they were, it's a completely different site. It just happened to be excavated originally by the same person who did the first report on that site. And, and so, you know, this is pulling together anything and everything that he catches their fancy throwing it into a pile and then stitching it into an argument. And that's just not how this should be done. Again, we're seeing many examples that you highlight here and clearance for everyone to understand how this works. When we talk about those, uh, you you addressed it here, but when we talk about those fire hardened floors, uh, give us an example of how they were used and why they were used just so that everyone can understand um, what that actually means. So the fire was a big part of a lot of the the rituals and activities that happened at the earthwork sites. There are uh, Mark Linet discovered at the Hopeton earthworks that underneath the embankment walls, uh, there were fires that were set on the ground surface, kind of as a way of it, of initiating the process of uh, of construction, and then the the earthworks were built on top of that. And then these fire hardened uh, surfaces, uh, they often end up inside of, of the large mounds. Some of them are, are, are mostly uh, burial mounds, uh, and some of them are uh, different kinds of uh, different kinds of ceremonial structures. They would pile whatever they were going to be incinerating onto this prepared clay basin and have a very intense large fire. One of the biggest deposits comes from Hopewell Mound 25, and there were multiple of these. They, they called them altars in that in that analysis of these clay basins within that mound, and one of them had several hundred pounds of copper ear spools that were a very you know exotic material. Takes lots of time to craft these things very carefully, and they piled hundreds of them onto this altar and then they had had a large fire and so there these kinds of features happen all the time and we know what they're what they're used for we know how they're created they're not it's not something that's coming down raining fire from the sky burning patches of the ground it's people doing their rituals building community together and so there's no need for a, a very imaginative story to explain them Uh, Very good. Dr. Murphy, what are your thoughts? Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. There's, we would know in the soil record and the stratigraphic record, if there was any kind of very uh, large uncontrolled burn, we know from many of these sites, again, with the context that Dr. Nolan is speaking to, you know, again, these were very innovative folks who were uh, understanding how to control burns, how to clear certain areas and how to create these you know, hot fires um, for these various purposes that we've described. And so it would be something completely different if there was this catastrophic landscape burning that was out of control that would have caused a mass confusion of, of the people um, that would have led to their ultimate collapse and things like that. There's just no um, stratigraphic evidence for that. And, you know, that's something that people keep talking about is the collapse of the Hope Wheel. Is there any indication that there actually was a cultural collapse or did they just simply move into the next phase of, of the woodland? Like, what are we talking about when we say cultural collapse? I keep hearing that come up. What do you think, Dr. Nolan? Well, I've never actually worked on anything that, that has to do with a, a, an actual collapse. Tony's actually got some some work that is relevant to what kinds of things you, you look for there. But, you know, I mean, there's not 100 percent agreement uh, about what caused the the decline. I have a a paper that I wrote over a decade ago now that discusses possible reasons for it. You do have changes in in the climate and in the weather 
uh, that start around 200 AD uh, and, and intensify. And we actually start to see in some places changes in participation in Hopewell rituals, Hopewell ceremonialism and exchange. So around in the 200 to 300 CE range, you have some of these settlement sites before they're like extended families of farmers scattered around the earthworks. Well, some of them move farther away from the earthworks and congregate in larger groups. And so they're already starting around 200 to some people are shifting their strategy of what kind of environments they're interacting with, what kind of, of communities they're building together. And so people start pulling out of that kind of participation as this change in climate is is ramping up. And then uh, around 400 A.D. Uh, is when a lot of the, the large earthworks stop. But there are still other places like the the man site in uh, southwestern Indiana. It, it continues after 500 as far as as we can tell from radiocarbon dates there. And I mean, it's a completely different kind of thing. But uh, so, you know, some places were still doing Hopewell like things while other people had already moved on and would be more culturally like what archaeologists tend to recognize as the the late woodland. And, and so it was just gradual cultural change in response to their local environment and in response to the communities that they were in and that they were building. A great explanation. And again, something we see with the Mississippian culture, going from the large mounds to eventually just sort of moving out into smaller family groups. Uh, These things are are not unusual within these communities over long periods of time. I want to come over to the chronological modeling. And Dr. Cruz, I'm going to come to you for this. But first, reading from the paper on on the first portion here. Quote, Tinkerly et al., chronological modeling is insufficiently explained methods, model code, etc., incorrectly characterized and does not support the inference of a single event. So, Dr. Cruz, I'm going to let you pick it up there. Tell us a little bit about things that you noticed that may be inaccurate within the chronological modeling. Yeah, certainly. And I, I just want to stress again that the chronology side of their paper is really central for making it seem like the airburst event actually happened and for estimating when it happened. And while they present uh, around 30 radiocarbon dates in their article, that's their main data that they use for chronology is radiocarbon dating. Only 20 of those come from the presumed airburst strata. And a big mystery, a big puzzle at the onset for the team here reassessing this paper was that it's not actually described in the Tankersley at all paper what methods they used for their chronological modeling. They do provide their probability results, and they state that they performed Bayesian adjustments, but it was they don't actually provide an in-depth description of what they did. So it, it is considered best practice with these types of analyses to have an in-depth description of what you're actually doing. And this usually involves sharing model code, or script so that everything can be reproduced. Otherwise, someone's analysis might not be fully reproducible. So why would you trust them? In this case, because there's that in-depth description is lacking, we had to try to figure out what exactly they did. And my understanding is that Kevin reached out to Tankersley about this soon after the original paper was published, but that he did not provide his modeling code. So what we discovered is that they re- the, the result they received for the timing of the airburst actually can be calculated by performing what is called a weighted mean on the 20 radiocarbon measurements that they say come from the airburst layer. Importantly, this calculation does not involve any Bayesian mathematics and is essentially an average of the 20 radiocarbon results. And I really want to stress that this method only makes sense for estimating the timing of a single event, the so-called airburst in this case. And so what I mean by a single event is an event where all the radiocarbon samples died at the same time. But as Kevin mentioned earlier, and I really appreciate the description that Kevin gave earlier of problematizing why, from a contextual standpoint, it's already clear that these radiocarbon dates aren't from a single event, there's there's additional evidence to suggest that they're, they're not from a single event and that this whole weighted mean idea as a mode of analysis, much less 
calculating the time of the airburst really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So first we found that the 20 radiocarbon samples, they failed to pass a chi-square test, indicating that they were very likely deposited over a prolonged period of time. And this strongly suggests that they do not date a single event. Secondly, the samples, the like actual physical materials sampled for radiocarbon dating, there's problems with that also. 13 of the radiocarbon dates from the airburst strata, or the so-called airburst strata, come from wood charcoal. So they might be impacted by what archaeologists refer to as an old wood effect. It may not reflect the timing of death of the trees that they come from. And then there are the issues that Kevin mentioned earlier that the dated samples, they're from separate archaeological features. There's nothing about their taphonomy, nothing about their context themselves that suggests that everything was happening at the same time. So in sum, the bottom line here is that the dated samples cannot be presumed to date a single event, and they do not support the airburst hypothesis, much less for calculating when it occurred. And so our reappraisal of the data from Tankersley et al.'s paper suggests that instead of an airburst layer, that these radiocarbon dates come from many discrete events over decades or centuries. Okay, so that's a lot of information to break down. Again, this is why I encourage everyone to get a copy of the paper, look at this stuff for yourself so that you can follow it uh, as we move through. But thank you for that explanation that certainly uh, clarifies a lot of what is being refuted from the Tankersley paper. The next section that we're going to move into is the cosmic geochemistry. Now, I think this is really going to drive home a lot of the points and give us some better insight into... uh, First, how they came about this conclusion in the first place and what, if any, actual evidence is there to present. So kicking off here, again, quoting from the paper, quote, Tankersley et al. misinterpret recent evidence for high temperature components in comets leading to problematic geochemical analysis interpretations of supposed palisite samples. Okay, so we're going to get more into this, and I'm going to bring the conversation over to Tim McCoy to kick us off on this section, because Tim, as someone with such a unique uh, set of skills and knowledge as yourself, kind of help us understand the uh, geochemistry a little bit more, and what exactly are the Tankersley Group presenting as evidence? So let's break it down into two sections. First, let's talk about the fact that they claim it's a comet. Right now, they found samples of palisites, larger samples of palisites, and I'm not surprised by that. I mean, palisites were worked by the Hopewell people in Ohio. We have artifacts, abundant artifacts, um, beads, stones, all sorts of things that were made from palisites. These palisites are mixtures of olivine. If any of you have the birthstone peridot, that's the gem name for olivine, and iron nickel metal. They're very sort of simple rocks if you're a petrologist, if you're someone who studies the, the mineralogy and chemistry of rocks. And so I'm not surprised that they found those, but they claimed that those were delivered by comets. Now, that struck me as odd because you can basically break the solar system into two kinds of things. There's the very primitive things that formed in the solar nebula, the cloud of gas and dust that our solar system formed from, and differentiated objects, things that came from differentiated layered worlds like our Earth. So the palisites came from a body that had a core, the iron nickel mantle, metal, a mantle, that olivine or peridot, and a crust, basalt, like you would see in Hawaii or Iceland or any number of places on the surface of the Earth. Comets, in fact, are very primitive objects, ice-rich. They did not melt and differentiate. And so trying to put those together really is a, is a mismatch, a huge mismatch. And we know this isotopically because that cloud of gas and dust that we live in, um, that our planet formed from, the sun formed from, all the asteroids and comets formed from, was bathed early in its history by isotopes from a nearby stellar explosion. And that stellar explosion introduced elements like titanium and chromium into our solar system. But there's a difference. So if you look at what we think is the inner solar system versus the outer solar system, those isotopes differ. And it's probably because Jupiter formed and formed a barrier from those isotopes getting into the inner solar system. Palisites formed in the inner solar system. Comets formed in the outer solar system. 
So it's almost impossible to envision that palisites could have come from comets. So that's sort of the first thing, and it refutes a cometary airburst. But of course, they might come back and say, well, that's fine, but we still have all this evidence that some kind of extraterrestrial material, like an asteroid. So I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions before I get into the next part of it, which was actually presented in their paper. Well, I'll say again, uh, a very thorough explanation. I am certainly not a planetary scientist. I work in environmental science, which picks up some of these things. However, I really appreciate the fact that you're here and you're able to provide us with that type of data. Uh, So please go ahead and give us the second half of this and let's see how it all works together. So the second part is, what did they actually find? They reported these analyses of spherules, right? So the spherules were were claimed to come from the palisite material, and they presented energy dispersive spectrometry. So this just measures the energy of of an X-ray given off by the interaction between an electron beam and the spherule they measured. It's a pretty simple technique. Um, My PhD advisor actually was one of the co-inventors of energy dispersive spectrometry. I've done tens of thousands of EDS spectra in my career. And I started looking at these spectra that they detail in the paper. So first they claimed that they had metallic particles from the iron nickel metal in the palisite. But if you look at the spectra of the spherules they presented, there's no nickel in them. There's almost no nickel, which is counter to what we would expect to see. And then you look at the silica-rich particles, which they claim were from the olivine component, and they have no magnesium in them. But olivine is an iron-magnesium silicate, so it's iron, magnesium, silicon, and oxygen. So the complete lack of magnesium in the silicate particles and the complete lack of nickel in the iron particles suggest these really have nothing to do with the palisite. These are probably local soils. Um, You have lots of aluminum and calcium and silicon, and in the iron particles, you have elements like aluminum and magnesium, uh, aluminum and calcium that really just shouldn't be there. And so probably what you have are iron oxide spherules and little soil particles that have formed spherules, perhaps through this burning that Kevin Nolan talked about, but I don't think these have anything to do at all with meteorites. I mean, there's just no evidence in the paper. And so... The only thing you're really left with are these platinum and iridium anomalies, which are, you know, they measure these, but they're very low. I mean, very low concentrations. And frankly, at the level that I can't be confident that they're not within the uncertainties of the local background. I mean, to do something like this, you really have to measure soils that you think weren't um, part of this. I mean, remember, Most of the material that rains down on us every day is micrometeorites. Tons of micrometeorites reach the Earth's surface every day. Um, Not big events, just small material raining down consistently. And so the fact that you would find very small amounts of iridium and platinum within background soils really doesn't surprise me that much. And I think um, in the same vein that, that Tony Cruz talked about, you know, they don't really provide the level of detail you would like about what the uncertainties are, what the standards they used are, and what the uncertainties on those standards. You know, they report some data on like, you know, what's our uncertainty on a pure platinum? Well, that's really not comparable. And so there's just, there's no there there. You know, there's no story there. And the more you pick it apart, the more you just say, even the evidence they present in their own support doesn't support them. So, you know, it's it's hard to see this as anything but we wanted a conclusion. So this is how we saw this. Right. And so I do have a question for you concerning the platinum and iridium. So being that the levels were uh, considerably lower than other sites, what amount would you expect to see from a true cosmic event just in general? It's, it's a good question. I mean, I don't think we know the answer very well to that. Uh, And I will give you an example that, you know, people have spent decades trying to understand the con- contribution to soils at the Tunguska site, for example, which many people think really was a legitimate cometary airburst sort of event, um, but did not lead to the complete destruction of a civilization around there. Um, but, you know, you would want to look for a consistently high, particularly iridium anomaly within there. And, 
you know, I looked at the concentrations. I can't remember the exact values, but, you know, go back and look at like the KT boundary that was analyzed uh, from Gubbio, Italy, the original site of there. I mean, it's nowhere close to those sorts of levels of concentrations in there. So we have examples where, you know, large scale impacts have contributed these sorts of materials to um, our planet. And uh, I, and again, I don't think that this rises to that sort of le level. All right. Very insightful. And I, I, again, appreciate you being here and being able to clarify some of those fine details for us. As we are approaching the end here, uh, I do want to read the last portion of the paper here. And then I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to give a final thought on today's discussion and uh, also provide our listeners with your contact information and uh, where they can find you out there on Internet. So first of all, as we get to the end of the paper here, these are some of the conclusions. So, quote, while not a comprehensive review of all of the issues with tanker leads at all, hope well airburst event, this brief summary demonstrates the systematic flaws in the analysis, interpretation of archaeological data, chronological data, and cosmic geochemistry. We find that their presentation and argument, one, does not support claims of a catastrophic regional burning, two, does not demonstrate their evidence is in fact synchronous and three does not demonstrate that microspherules are related to meteorites four mistakenly claims that palisite fragments could have originated in comets and five does not provide evidence for a widespread decline in Hopewell culture in short their observations fail to demonstrate any aspect of this cosmic catastrophe okay I think that pretty well sums it up. As we sign off here, Dr. Nolan, please, what are your final thoughts on today's discussion in this paper and also provide our listeners with your contact information? I think the thing I want to end with emphasizing is what Tim just brought up is that, you know, they started with a conclusion that they wanted and then they picked the the information that that they thought could go in that direction and made the made it fit because they already knew what they wanted to say. Um, you know, the only reason to combine some of these samples into one is because they have to be combined in order for them to be able to, to try to say what they wanted to say. So, you know, that's not how we do scientific research. You don't start with an answer. You start with a question. And that's what the Comet Research Group does. They go when they know what they want to find, and they find it everywhere they look. So they only have one kind of tool and they only find one kind of answer. I guess my contact information, um, it, my email address is kcnolan at bsu.edu, bsu for Ball State. And I encourage anybody who's interested in looking at some actual uh, archaeology from the Ohio Valley, the Ohio Archaeological Council uh, has a, a journal and a current research section where uh, – periodic updates on actual uh, ongoing research in Ohio uh, is available. And those are all open access. Uh, anybody can look at them and read them and encourage people to engage with that archaeology. Excellent. Thank you for that information. Uh, Dr. Cruz, we're going to come to you next. Uh, what are your final thoughts and what is your contact information? Well, I think one of the most gratifying parts of being a, a member of this uh, wonderful team is been that this this process to me has shown the power that science and the scientific process can have in archaeology. I know a lot of colleagues have reached out to the team and said that they plan on using this rebuttal as an example of how the scientific process can work in archaeology. So I think my final thought here is that I encourage our colleagues to do that if they're teaching classes and to maybe draw upon this example is how archaeological science can combat the prevalence of uh, widespread speculation and sensationalism in the discipline. And my uh, contact information, my email address is Tony, T-O-N-Y dot Cruz, that is K-R-U-S at U-S-D for the University of South Dakota dot E-D-U. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Laura Murphy, what are your final thoughts on this conversation? Really, of course, my message that I want to get out there is, is to be cautious of these sensationalist claims, claims that might get put out there and then picked up by media spread around. And 
the casual observer will kind of take that in and be like, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, a, another, you know, culture collapsed um, and kind of move on. And so it's kind of left to us to pick up that burden and, you know, refute the claims and do that hard work um, behind the scenes. And so I think it's important to point out that, you know, sensationalist claims, the cosmic catastrophism needs to be uh, reined in and supported with evidence if it's going to be out there, um, because it does a real disservice to the indigenous peoples who created these mounds and earthworks. They they shouldn't be just reduced to uh, confused people from a cosmic airburst that decimated their culture, because that's just not what happened. Um, So that would be my final thought. And my contact information is laura.murphy at washburn.edu. And you can find me and interact with me on X at rock.goarch. That's R-O-C-K-D-O-C-G-E-O-A-R-C-H. Thank you very much. And a final word tonight will go to Dr. Tim McCoy. Put a bow on it for us. Yeah, I'll just I'll build on what uh, Dr. Murphy said, which is as a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, I think, you know, coming at this from the outside, some of us um, see language that geologists or archaeologists use, like hunter-gatherer, but to the public that says, well, we were primitive peoples, right? And I think the hope well is really a testament to the fact of how complex civilization have existed in our homelands for thousands of years. You know, these were complex people. They had metal workers. They had complex mound building. I mean, they had people who went on long distance collection expeditions. They had trade networks. And I think it's really important we recognize that this is not something, you know, these were not primitive people living hand to mouth. These were people who figured out complex civilizations, as complex as in any other part of the world. And I think that's really important. And when something like a piece of pseudoscience comes along that diminishes that, I really feel sorry for it. And my contact information is McCoyT, M-C-C-O-Y-T, at si.edu. Feel free to shoot me an email, but I hope you'll be patient because in uh, something like 10 days, I'm going to be in Utah recovering a sample that I've been waiting on for 20 years. I'm coming back from the asteroid Bennu, and 11 days later, I'm going to be at the Cape, at Cape Canaveral, with the launch of a mission called Psyche, going to a metallic asteroid. And so stay tuned for those if you want to learn a little bit more about what's going on in planetary science today. Well, absolutely. We will keep our eyes and ears open for that. Everyone here on the Seven Ages team thanks you, and we're going to wrap it up tonight with my co-host, geologist extraordinaire James Waldo. What are your final thoughts? I don't know about extraordinaire, but I appreciate you saying that. First, I want to say thanks for everybody on the panel tonight. Uh, Great breakdown and explanation. Uh, Usually on these shows, I have a lot of questions. I'm not an archaeologist or an anthropologist, but I do. I'm a Professionally, I'm a geologist, what I do every day. So I always have a lot of uh, technical questions or questions about methodology. So Dr. Murphy and Mr. McCoy, certainly appreciate your technical breakdown on this because I really did have uh, a few questions brewing in my head in regards to the original paper about sample collection, methodology, and, you know, where they collected the samples and how they were collected. And you explained all of that. And I, you literally answered all the questions that I didn't even ask. So thank you. Excellent. Well, it sounds like we had a good roundtable discussion here tonight. Again, we thank you all for listening. And to all of our guests here tonight, we thank you on behalf of the Seven Ages team. And we'll look forward to catching up with you in the future. Thank you all for being here. Fantastic conversation, and again, it really makes me miss Ohio archaeology. We have spent some time up there, the team together, in the past, and I do hope to get back up there and actually get on the ground in the field, so to speak. We've got a lot of friends who are archaeologists who live up in that area, too, and it will be great to see them. But again, so much to learn about that, and as evidenced by this conversation, we are still learning an awful lot, too. 
Yeah, there's a lot to uh, a topic like this. There's so many uh, moving parts and so many pieces. And I do want to clarify a couple of things. Uh, one is that this is uh, by no means uh, aimed to be disrespectful toward the research of Kenneth Tankersley. Um, he has published quite a bit within that realm. And so we want to make it clear that uh, we are simply discussing how these things come about and the information that may have been inaccurate or at least being challenged within the work that he put forth. I do have to also tell the listeners that I have it on a good faith that that paper, the Hopewell Airburst event that was published by uh, Kenneth Tankersley at all is under review yet again by a team who is going over it with a fine tooth comb to help uh, potentially revise it for future publication. So it, it may not be completely off the map. It may be undergoing some uh, cleanups here and there, but we may possibly see this again in the future. Yeah. Once again, that's kind of how this process goes. And having met Kenneth, you know, and spoken to him at length, he's a great guy. Uh, and naturally, I hope that the combined effort of scientists sometimes coming at these things from different directions, but ultimately advancing all of our knowledge, I hope that the ultimate outcome is a deeper understanding of things that have been happening in the ancient world. So with that, I do think it's about time for last call, guys. So we're going to pony on up here and be on our way. Always a pleasure to be in the presence of Jason Pentrail and James Waldo. And of course, all of you out there, you can keep up with us at sevenages.org and also on social media. Until next time, my friends, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates exploring the wonders of the past. And we'll be back again soon on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. <laughs>